Israel and the desert. This is, this is obviously, this is one of my favorite, uh, this is another one of my favorite passages from Isaiah and the promises of what will come. And this image of the desert, the wilderness, the wilderness for the Israelites, the wilderness for the Jews was the desert. That was what was in their backyard. And it struck me this week that the wilderness for us, what's in our backyard in the Pacific Northwest is alpine wilderness. We're not surrounded by desert wilderness. We're surrounded by alpine wilderness. And, and it reminded me, and I, please trust me, that I will connect this story up to this passage. <laughs> it's going to be a little while, though. So just enjoy the story. It reminded me of a story I read sitting out on our deck on a warm July day this past, uh, this past summer. It was a story about alpine wilderness up in Denali. It was called, it's a story in Business Insider called Disaster on Denali. Uh, it was a story of four people attempting to summit Denali. And what you're looking at is the summit route to get up Denali, the mountain formerly known as Mount McKinley up in Alaska. It's the highest peak in the United States. Um, the four people, they were uh, uh, two climbing partners is who the story is about. The first is, are two friends who were named Grant, are named Grant Wilson and Sarah Maynard. I've got a picture of them for you. Grant and Sarah grew up in Alaska, early 20s, uh, did a lot of alpine work. This was their big uh, adventure to go up Denali, which they had grown up in towns looking at this mountain. And they uh, joined up with two other climbers who were partnered up, Climbers named Dr. Jason Lance, who was, uh, he's the one in the green jacket there. He was in his 40s, a doctor from Utah, also very experienced in alpine wilderness and climbing. He had joined up at the very last minute with a young man named Adam Rowski in his early 30s, climber from Canada. They didn't start out as climbing partners in Denali. They got up to the highest camps there, and their own climbing partners backed out for various reasons. So at the last minute, Adam and Jason decided to go together. Um, now this caught my attention because in what you're looking at now is the final push to the summit, which is where this story takes place. And uh, I'm very familiar with this because my brother and his three young adult children, you may remember, uh, made two attempts on Denali in 2017, 2019. They, they, they summited in 2019. But the story that I'm going to tell you here were events that happened in 2021. It was a year when there were 20 search and rescue efforts on the mountain and two fatalities. Uh, spoiler alert. Well, I'm not going to spoiler alert. You're just going to have to wait and find out who makes it off this mountain. But Vlamis, Kelsey Vlamis' article tells the story of these four climbers on the day they attempted to summit. The day they attempted to go from high camp, which is at uh, 17,200 uh, feet, and get up, make a push up to the summit and then make it back down. Uh, and when you are making that push up and then you're coming back down, you come to the snow field called the Autobahn. And the reason it's called that, and you're looking at a picture from when uh, two of the over 14 deaths since 1980 have occurred on the Autobahn, is it is a, a, a field of snow and ice that descends down from Denali Pass. And uh, this is a picture of one of, the, um, uh, one of the four climbers at the top of that Autobahn as they started making their way up, Adam Rowski. And I'll just leave that picture there for a moment. See, to exhausted and experienced climbers, go ahead and back it up one, Sam. I'm going to leave it on the picture of Sam. Perfect, thanks. To exhausted and, um, uh, and inexperienced, less experienced climbers, when they get to the top of that Autobahn and they need to make it down, the problem is it doesn't look steep enough to them to be dangerous. And that's where the problems start because ironically, it's the less experienced climbers who are more likely to descend the Audubon without their ropes, without hooking him. And the overconfidence paired with inexperience leads to what happened that day. Now this photo from Grant that Adam took this photo of Adam that Grant took at the top of the Audubon was on their ascent. Uh, but here you see, I just want you to remember Adam's smiling face because he suddenly disappeared and was spotted in a crumple of bright blue puffer a thousand feet below at the bottom of the slope, lying motionless. Now, remarkably, Adam did not die. 
And certainly it's because there were a number of circumstances that conspired to save his life. One of them was the place where he fell was in full view of high camp. Go ahead and back it up, Sam one, and we'll leave it there. By the way, I am so grateful for the folks who do our slides because I threw all this at him at the last minute this morning. And so he is just a champ for trying to keep up with me. Adam didn't die. Part of the reason is because the people at high camp, the guides at high camp, saw him uh, fall down the Autobahn. Uh, he was wearing that bright blue in full view. It was a clear day. And so they immediately phoned it in, called it in on their radios. The second reason is because the rescue helicopter, which would usually be back uh, 75 miles to the south of the park at Talkeetna, which is a tiny town where everyone starts out this, that rescue helicopter was actually at base camp. It had brought in some scientists to do glacial sampling and was waiting for them to take them back out. So the most accomplished helicopter pilot on the mountain, a man named Andy Hermansky, happened to be there. And he was at Adam within 30 minutes. Now, you can't land at the place where Adam fell. He did this very remarkably um, difficult and dangerous maneuver where he, he, he points the front of the helicopter down, keeps the tail up. The, the rotor blades, the choppers, are within feet of the ground. And then the guide who was inside the chopper, um, uh, a man named uh, Tucker Chenoweth was involved with this, uh, they, they very slowly go down the, um, uh, I'm going to get my word right, the skids. They slowly go down the skids so they don't tip over the, uh, uh, the helicopter, they don't imbalance it. Other guides from high camp came and helped. They did an overhead body press, loaded the injured Roski into the helicopter, and that saved his life. He was seven months in hospital, the first two in a coma. Uh, but last December, he walked out, and he's learning to walk again, just learning to, to jog again. Now, the three climbers up on the Audubon had a much harder time. Uh, once they saw the trauma of him, they thought he had died. They saw his rescue. Now they had to get themselves down. And uh, the, the last-minute partner for Adam um, actually ended up, the reason the story's in there, and it, you can read much more about it if you Google it, not during my sermon, but later on this afternoon. Uh, they're, they're, the Adam's last-minute climbing partner was later fined $10,000, given a five-year climbing uh, ban from Denali, because after the fall, he wanted to phone in for a rescue. Uh, he did not want to have to make his own way down the Audubon with the two that were there, and Sarah and Grant finally convinced him after many hours to rope up and descend with them. And the article wonders why an experienced climber would, would deceive search and rescue like that. Sarah chalked it up to his actions to uh, ignorance, to a heightened sense of self-importance. She says he was definitely just trying anything and everything to find the magic words to get off the mountain. Now, Tucker Chenoweth, who I mentioned, the head of Denali South District Ranger who oversees rescues, he, he, he mentions how they are seeing a noticeable shift in people who arrive at Denali. And his words are, we get more summit chasers and fewer wilderness seekers. Now remember that, I'm going to come back to it. More summit chasers and fewer wilderness seekers. And here's what really caught my attention. The article observes that the places we visit are still wild. And while that doesn't mean we should not go, we should treat them with the reverence they deserve when we do. Climbers typically fly to Alaska on a commercial airplane. They take a shuttle to a hotel, go grocery shopping. They hop on a smaller plane, get dropped off in the wilderness. Even when they arrive, there are other climbers on the glacier fostering a deceiving sense of safety in numbers. And better and cheaper satellite communication devices have also helped create a false sense of security. Most climbers taking on Denali would not be able to get back to civilization if the plane never came back to pick them up. And the story ends with this statement from Chenoweth, who, who leads the search and rescue. They lose their sense of scale. And I think people don't quite recognize how deep in the wilderness they are. Let me put that up on a slide for you. They lose their sense of scale. And I think people don't quite recognize how deep in the wilderness they are. I'm going to leave that back up there because that's where this connects to Advent. 
they lose their sense of scale. And I don't think people realize how deep in the wilderness they are. See, many years ago the, in the ancient church, they knew that we as human persons lose our sense of scale. We don't realize how deep in the wilderness we are. For, the, for Israel, that wilderness was desert. For our part of the world, that wilderness is alpine. In either place, in either place, the, the reality is that no amount of technology, no distractions, no natural protection from predators, there's no way to control the natural resources at our disposal. But we lose that sense of scale. The main metaphor in scripture for the life of faith and the life of journey through this world is wilderness. But so often the way our culture talks about faith and spiritual discovery, the way that, that we frame it in the church, you'd think that we were taking a hike up Mount Si, right? We figure we can pretty much handle this. And then something comes along like a pandemic. Something comes along like a, a marriage implodes, an illness hits, a death occurs, uh, an, an economic change threatens our livelihood. Something comes along and we suddenly realize that this slope we were not roped up on is too steep and we can't stop the descent and the fall and we need a rescue. Advent was created to remind us we live in the wilderness. We are a people who, despite all our best efforts, need a rescue. What struck me is those four people on the mountain, they weren't novices. They had experience. The two Alaska natives, they knew Alaska. They just got careless. They thought they had it. And I wonder if in our own ignorance as, as people of faith in the world, or there's deceptive signals of safety in number or heightened self-importance, we also lose our sense of reality. That on our own, we are too weak to safely navigate the wilderness of this lifetime. Now there's all sorts of signs in the Isaiah passage we need a rescue. If you look at the passage again, you hear it in there. You hear exhaustion and weariness. How tired are you? How tired are the people around you? You hear a loss of flourishing, a desire for, for there to be flourishing and blossoming, and it's not happening. It's just too dry internally. You hear the need for healing, physical healing of the blind, the deaf, the lame, and the dumb, but you also hear the need for encouragement and healing for those with weak knees, for those who have a loss of heart and a loss of courage. We hear fear and anxiety in the passage. We hear about the regathering of people who are scattered and divided, who have been trapped and imprisoned by sin and need to be redeemed. We hear the making of a way for people who are lost without a way through, who are preyed upon, as we spoke about in previous weeks, who are chased and surrounded by sadness or sorrow. The prophets pile it on, Advent piles it on, in order to restore to restore our sense of scale that we are in the wilderness. A prophet like Isaiah at this place piles it on in order to say you're in the wilderness and here's the good news, you're not alone. You are not without rescue. The voice of the prophet in Advent cries out to wake us up for our need for rescue. Now, I want to suggest to you an Advent practice for this, for this, uh, for this week. Because some of us, when I read that list, we uh, connect to that no problem. We know where that is in our lives and around us. And some of us are like, yeah, I can kind of, I can see where that is, but that's not where I am right now. I'm doing pretty well. I'm at the top of the Audubon and I've got this. For all of us, whether we're in the place where we are fully aware of that wilderness experience, or whether we are experienced and strong in the ways of faith and we're at the top of the Audubon, I'm going to encourage you to take 15 minutes a day this week of silence. Because silence is the predominant practice of the wilderness. Not reading anything, not looking at anything. 
If you have to start the practice in your car because there's no place else you can get silence right now, that's fair enough, but try to move it into another place. You all have, most of us have a pause button on our cable and satellite. If you take your 15 minutes of silence before you watch the news or your show or whatever it is you're going to watch, you just get to fast forward through ads. It's a bonus. But silence is where the wilderness catches up with you. Silence is where any of the fears or anxieties, the sadness or the anger, the uncertainty, or just the apathy, catch up. Allow silence to restore that sense of scale. And then read again the good news from Isaiah 35. Let it be your closing passage every day this week to your time of silence. Hear this good news from Isaiah 35. That the delight and the joy of God is to make a way through this wilderness. And this is the second place that at least in my own little head and heart this week, this story from Denali connected to Isaiah's passage. Isaiah talks in terms of two ways of salvation. The first is he talks about the joy of the, of the wilderness and the dry places suddenly having water. And we can relate to that, right? Thirsty places, suddenly we have water and the wilderness blooms. We, how many of you have a Christmas cactus in your house? We have a Christmas cactus in the corner. I did not remind our house sitter to water it while we were gone. I don't know if she did or not, but it was pretty dry when we got home. Put some water on that thing. Oh, my land, it is full of blossoms. I don't know what it is about cacti. They'll just sit there without water for so long, and you should, it's huge. It's got so many blossoms. I don't have a picture for you, sorry. It's beautiful. It's blooming, right? This is one of the images in Isaiah. But that image is leading into the core image, which is there in verses three and four, which is the way through the wilderness. And that's the next slide I'm going to put up for you. What is required is a way through. The reason the wilderness is rejoicing, the reason everything is popping out in flowers and flourishing and blossoming, the reason there is water, the reason the hot sand won't burn your feet any longer, the reason is because there's salvation in the wilderness. And the salvation is put forward in this prophetic vision as a way through. As a way through. There will be a highway called the Holy Road. It is for God's people exclusively. It's impossible to get lost on the road. Not even fools can get lost on it. See, the source of rescue is God's activity making a highway. Those verses in there that talk about the unclean and only God's people being on it, they're talking about those who have stubbornly resisted and, 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 and reject any idea they have to be prepared. Those are the unclean. Uh, the fools are more like those who, who just overestimated their capacities on the mountain and then found themselves in a terrible place. What is required is a way through. The glory, the majesty of the Lord is what's going to make the bloom and the blossom abundantly. God is going to help Israel get its just due. God is going to bring the disastrous situation to order. God shows himself to be their God. And as a result, the eyes of the blind are opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame leap, the tongue of the mute sing for joy. God makes a way to overcome the dangers of the wilderness. He waters it in the wilderness, streams in the desert, sorrow and singing flee away so that the captive returns on this way with singing. There's nothing in the way anymore. And we know because of Advent that God comes deeper still into our predicaments, into our dry places, into our dangerous places, in the person of Jesus Christ, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Remember how John writes, we have seen his glory the glory as of a father's only son. You remember how Jesus stood in, in, in the midst of the temple and said, all you who are thirsty, come to me. I'll give you something to drink. He told the woman at the well, if you knew who I was, you would ask for living water to eternal life. He told everyone who was weary and disheartened to, to come to me for I am gentle 
and, and, and come to me all you who are weary laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. This is Jesus who opened the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, healed the lame and opened the mouth of the mute. Jesus who for the joy set before him of redeeming the broken and rescuing the fallen, of finding the lost and bringing them home, endured the cross. This is the point of the wilderness story. That as deep as we are in the wilderness, God has gone deeper still. That there is no place you are lost or broken or in danger that God in God's flesh has not taken up. This is the good news of Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. The second way, the second place that I, that I just so connected to this story was a statement that Chenoweth made that I asked you to remember, that rangers are seeing more summit chasers and fewer wilderness seekers. I have a slide for you on that one too. See, the point of the article about the Denali rescue wasn't to stop all climbing, right? The point was to call for fewer summit chasers and more wilderness seekers. Fewer summit chasers and more wilderness seekers. And you know what struck me? If there was ever a summit chasing season, it's Christmas, isn't it? There's a lot. Go for it. Fill your life. Pack it up. There is so much. You are going for the summit. You need to make memories this year that will last forever for your children, and they better all be good, <laughs> right? Christmas in our culture is a summit-chasing season because we as human beings in our culture are summit-chasing people. You see, our story, because it's the human story, is that joy is the overflow of already taking everything you want and need. Joy comes because you've been successful. Joy comes because you're full. Joy comes because you have everything you want. The story of Advent says wilderness is the place that joy surprises you. The empty place is the place you will be surprised by joy. Because joy in the story of Advent is a response to salvation. To salvation. Reading the story and reading about these two Alaska natives and, and this, uh, this other um, climber, this selfish climber that just left them to go to the summit, that left his weaker partner behind and figured they would take care of him, uh, that tried to lie to get off the mountain. I was, I was so annoyed on their behalf, right? Here's these two really cool people in their early 20s. They know this mountain. They're being smart. They should have been able to summit. They got held back because this other guy wasn't doing what he I mean, I was just, I, I was summit thinking, right? I was summit thinking. And I hit this part in the article where one of these two people, Grant, uh, here's, here's what the other climber said. First of all, Lance, who was abandoned, said, I don't really feel like he abandoned me too much. I just felt like more that sort of lone wolf is who he is, who wanted to make it to the summit no matter what, whether it be solo or with the group. At 19,200 feet, only less than a quarter mile from the summit, Maynard and Wilson decided they had to turn back because they couldn't find the fourth climber, Lance. He was out of sight, lone wolfing it. And they needed to turn back because Adam was in bad shape and they too were starting to slow down. But first, the three of them paused to look around and take it all in. Their high point on Denali. Grant Wilson said, for the first time in the day, Adam kind of seemed like himself for a little bit. He asked us to take some videos of him. He wanted them to take a video for his girlfriend. He, Maynard remembered him playfully shouting out his love from the highest point on the continent. And Grant Wilson, who'd grown up in Alaska, said, I was able to look back and see my hometown, where I've seen Denali on the horizon for most of my life. That was really amazing. He put up an Instagram post a couple days after he got down from this, uh, from this experience. He called it the best day of his life until it became the worst day when Adam disappeared. But what struck me was it was the best day of his life without the summit. When I read his descriptions in the article, I'm like, how do you be so gracious? And now I realized he wasn't being gracious. He was being honest. This is who he was. He was there for the wilderness. He was there for the wilderness. He said in his Instagram post, it wasn't a hard decision whatsoever to turn back with Adam. They didn't even second guess it. They weren't there for the summit. They were there for the wilderness. 
Advent takes us out to the wilderness to surprise us with joy. The wilderness is where we're surprised with joy. Advent is a place of emptiness rather than abundance so that we can experience the pattern of incarnation. Advent is the place where all the parts inside of us that go, you know, I'm not really sure God wants me to be happy, discovers that he wants you to know joy. And it's in his salvation, not the summit. Remember one time with one of my nieces and nephews who shall go unnamed, I looked and looked and looked for a gift I wanted to give them. Chose this gift, I was so excited. Gave this gift to this unnamed niece or nephew when they were little. And they opened it up and then they looked at it and they said, oh yeah, I got five of those. (laughs) You know, right, how this goes? Moved on, right? And I'm like so bummed. But, you know, there was no room for joy at this gift. Now they're a child and I love them and and yes, I'm judging them, let's admit it, I'm that kind of aunt. (laughs) But there's no room for joy in that gift. I've got five of those, right? If we don't think we need rescue... If we figure we've already got, we've got no room for the joy of salvation. Joy is the response of the rescued. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and shouting. The litany of healing in this passage ends with shouts of joy. The return along the way that Jesus had made. Jesus who is the way. The ransomed will return singing. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Everlasting joy will be upon their heads. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. Joy in Isaiah is the overflow of the abundance of God's salvation. Joy meets us in the wilderness, in the empty places where we need rescue, the dry places, the dangerous places. And I have good news for you. Those of you who already know the wilderness and already know you're in need of rescue this season, the good news is you're in the perfect Advent place. This is where Jesus is coming to meet you. The very place of your exhaustion and dryness, your weakness, your fear, your anxiety, your failure, your places captured by sin, your physical illness, your loss, your sadness and sorrow, this is where Jesus is born to meet you with the good news that he is the way through and he intends joy. And what about those of you who are not in life circumstances that, uh, that feel empty right now? Well, there are two commands in this passage. Look back on verses three and four. Strengthen the weak hands. This is the last slide I'll show you. And make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful of heart, be strong, do not fear. And if you're looking at your passage, it doesn't show on the slide, but here's what your passage says. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Here is your God. He will come to make it all right. He will come and save you. I think of Grant Wilson and Sarah Maynard on that mountain. It wasn't a hard decision to turn back because we are called to strengthen. We're called to speak good news to those who are fearful in heart. We are called to experience the joy of the Lord's salvation because we speak it to others that God cares about justice, God cares about healing, God cares about flourishing, God cares about hope, he cares about joy. Be strong, do not fear. Along with saying those things, we take steps to strengthen them. This is why even if you don't know any of the people in Howell that we're sending these cards to, if you'll just go in and put your name on it, because we send a card to say to people, you're not alone. You're making this journey. We're with you. You don't even know our name, but you're a part of this family. We do tangible things. It's why we did things like Bless Big Local. When Rick took the uh, check to one of the food banks this week, he gave them the envelope and they said thank you. And then later they called him because they'd opened it. <laughs> <laughs> right? That, it's, it's a sign. It's a symbol that we're not off this mountain. But, the, but rescue is coming to strengthen, to both say it and to actually take actions to strengthen. Do you remember when John the Baptist, in prison where he would face his own death, sent his discouraged message to Jesus? Are you the one? Or should I have been looking someplace else? And do you remember what Jesus said back? Tell him what you see. The ears of the deaf are opened. The eyes of the blind see. The lame leap for joy. The tongues of the mute are singing. Let's pray. 